Y'all know me, I'm Dr. B, and this is The Buzz on Otitis Media. The last time we talked about outer ear infections, let's dive a little deeper into the ear, literally, and talk about the middle ear and middle ear infections, or otitis media. Now, when someone says, I think my kid has an ear infection, what they're talking about is an infection on the inner side of the eardrum. And that's called the middle ear, that little chamber there. And when you get an infection in that, in that section of the ear, we call it an otitis media or a middle ear infection. And here's a diagram of the anatomy that we're talking about. This child's looking to the left, and you can see the nasal cavity, and it goes back to where it says adenoid. That's the lymph tissue that's in the back of the nose, and right behind the nose. And coming from there, you can see a, a canal, a tube called the eustachian tube. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. And that leads to a little chamber called the middle ear, which is where these infections are going to occur. And to the right of that chamber is an eardrum. And then to the right of that is the ear canal. Middle ear infections almost always start with a viral nose or throat cold. And what happens is swelling and inflammation builds up usually over a few days, and it irritates that eustachian tube that leads from the back of the nose to the ear, and that allows the viral cold to spread to the ears. Once that viral inf infection gets to the ears, some fluid starts building up in the middle ear, and that gets trapped there uh, because of the swelling and inflammation in that eustachian tube, and it causes the eardrum to bulge out, and it's very painful. When you get that fluid in there, it's a great environment for growing bacteria. So the viral infection soon turns into a bacterial ear infection. And that's typically uh, happens after a few days of cold symptoms. And now they've developed a fever and they're complaining of ear pain on one side. And that's usually when they're brought to our office to be checked out. Now, usually we can pretty much diagnose this just from the history that you tell us. They've had a cold for a few days. Now they've got fever and pain on one side in one ear. Uh, sometimes with the younger kids, it can be a little bit trickier to figure out just from the history. The child may be cranky. They're probably not going to say, my ear hurts and point to their ear if they're only a few months old. Uh, but they may not eat well. They may not want to lie down because sometimes that'll, that'll make the pain worse. And at that point, we have to take a look inside the ear and see what's going on. So this is what we see when we look inside the ear. The, what looks like a donut around the outside, that's actually looking down the ear canal. And the eardrum is the thin, shiny, looks like a membrane. And you can actually see through that. What you're seeing through that is into the middle ear. There's even a nice little triangular shine there on the bottom right. That's what we call the cone of light. That is a normal looking, healthy eardrum. Now this, is a picture of a pretty standard otitis media. And this, you can see that the eardrum has kind of lost the same uh, architecture. It looks completely different. It looks like a completely different shape. In fact, it looks like it's bulging out. And you can see it doesn't look shiny and thin anymore. It looks like it's kind of thick. And you might even be able to appreciate that there's some kind of maybe cheesy thickness or or uh, uh, soupy stuff behind the eardrum. You can't really see through the eardrum anymore. It doesn't look transparent anymore. That's what we're looking for when we're looking for someone who might have an ear infection. This we usually treat with oral antibiotics, and generally it does go away pretty easy without any complication. However, if the ear infection goes on too long or a lot of pressure builds up behind the eardrum, the eardrum can burst and pus and, and some blood can come out of the ear. And that is what you see in this picture. This is not an acutely perforated eardrum. This one has been perforated for a long time. It's kind of left a permanent hole that'll need to be patched at some time. But this is called a perforated eardrum. And the usual story that we get when this happens abruptly is that the child goes to bed feeling pretty lousy and they wake up with some blood or pus on the pillow and they feel a lot better in the morning because that pressure has been relieved. And often this actually occurs before we even hear about that they've had the ear pain and uh, before we even get to see them. Now, perforated eardrum, I make it sound terrible, and it kind of is. But in the old days, before we had antibiotics, that was actually how an ear infection was fixed. They would go in with a little knife and they'd nick 
the eardrum and let all the pus come out. We treat this in ex pretty much exactly the same way. We put you on antibiotics for like 10 days. And over time, over the next few weeks, the hole in the eardrum will close and everything should be okay. If it happens over and over, there can be problems. But if it only happens once, maybe twice in a child's lifetime, it shouldn't cause any permanent problems. Now, there's one other type of middle ear infection that I want to mention, and that is bullous meringitis. This is a picture of bullous meringitis. This type of infection has blisters on the eardrum. So not only is the eardrum bulging out, but it has blisters on it. These things that look like there's, looks like there's three of them. They look like these big thin balloons. I only mention this because if I say your child has bullous meringitis, it may perforate, it's more likely to perforate, and it is intensely painful. So these kids are gonna need some Tylenol Motrin, and, um, but that's okay, you know, because even if it does perforate, you now know that that's going to make it feel better. We treat this in the same way as we treat regular otitis media, and it should go away just as quickly. There's another situation where a child can have ear pain, but when we look in there, there's actually no infection that we can see. And I'm going to use a model to demonstrate this. Now, this is a model of the ear, and here's the ear canal, and here's the eardrum. The eardrum's not purple, as you know, but that's what it is on this model. Here's the middle ear right in here, which is where your infection will occur. And this is a use station tube that goes to the back of the nose and throat. So sometimes your kid will have a vague ear pain, or maybe the ear pain's been going on for a while. Maybe the ear pain actually switches from one side to the other. In that case, you may have what's called eustachian tube dysfunction. We look in there, we don't see an infection in the middle ear, but the child is clearly having pain. The reason this happens is that this tube is supposed to be full of air and it's supposed to be open so that air can come in and go out if it needs to and it can equalize the pressure. So just like if you are on an airplane and you feel that pressure in your ears, if you could look in your ear when you're on an airplane, it should look normal. That's what we're talking about in this case. And usually this occurs because a child has a cold or a sore throat and it irritates this tube, but when we look in the ear, we don't see an ear infection. Eustachian tube dysfunction. If your child is diagnosed with that, all you have to do for that is give them some Tylenol or Motrin. And as soon as the infection, as soon as the nose cold and the sore throat infection goes away, then the ear should start feeling better. The final thing I want to talk about with diagnosis is a lot of parents say, hey, can I get one of those ear looky things called an otoscope so that I can look in the ear and see if my child has an ear infection? Yes, you can actually go buy one. I don't recommend looking in the ear because if you injure the eardrum, that can cause some permanent problems but you could look and see what you see. You're still gonna have to know what you're looking at and know what to do based on what you see. So don't usually recommend that, but you can buy one. Um, if you do see something that has you worried, then please bring them in. We'll take a look at it together and see what we're seeing. And maybe that can give you some more information, but generally I don't recommend trying to treat these or trying to diagnose these at all. Now in treating otitis media, we like to use oral antibiotics. And this is a chart of the more common antibiotics that we use. Across the top, you can see antibiotic, the number of doses daily. This is probably the most important information for parents. How many doses daily? What's the flavor? And what side effects do we see? The one that we're going to use most commonly is amoxicillin. The brand name is usually amoxil. We use that two or three times a day. It is bubble gum flavor, so everyone calls this the bubble gum medicine. And the side effects are usually minimal. Sometimes when the ear infection goes away, you may see a rash on the torso. That does not usually mean that you have an allergy to amoxicillin. Very often it's just kind of a, a, a sign that things are actually getting better. But if you have concerns about that rash when you take this medicine, definitely talk to your doctor, make sure it's not an allergy, but that does happen. The next one is amoxicillin clavulinate or augmentin. Uh, this is used in uh, two doses a day. This is really does not taste good. <laughs> it's, it's a banana and fruit flavor. I'd, I'd say it's like banana pineapple. It is uh, definitely not, not great tasting. It is commonly known as the white medicine. It's kind of thick and gross, but you can have these things flavored. You can change the flavor profile on all these. This is a much uh, heavier duty medicine. And uh, when, when amoxicillin fails, we very often move to augment. And um, the side effect from this is well known for causing diarrhea if you take it on an empty stomach. So if you take this, or if you've been prescribed this, 
uh, we will recommend usually taking a probiotic and eating before you take it. Cephalexin or Keflex is a cephalosporin that's given at least three times a day and comes as orange flavor or banana, and the side effects are usually minimal. Ceftonir or Omniceph is given one or, once or twice a day. It, this one actually tastes pretty good too. Uh, it's strawberry flavor. Some people get stomach upset, but generally uh, the side effect profile for that is pretty good. And the last one is azithromycin or Zithromax, and that's taken once a day for five days. Uh, it says it comes as cherry banana. I'm, I'm not sure of these flavors or who decided that. I'd, I'd say it's just a sugary, gritty flavor. If you take this on an empty stomach, vomiting is typically what we see with that. Um, these are just the ones that we use over and over because they work well and kids tolerate them well. The choice of what we use or if we go outside of these uh, medications, it really depends on when they had their last ear infection, how many they've had, medication allergies, community uh, resistance profiles, that sort of thing, seeing what, what will work in your community. So the list, if you're not one of my patients, may be completely different, but these are very, very common medications. Sometimes if your child has been vomiting uh, and can't seem to keep any of these medicines down, or if they've had ear infections that we've gone through a lot of different antibiotics and they're just not getting better, we will reach for an injection called ceftriaxone or rocephin. That is pretty painful and that is heavy duty. So we do not do that very often, but sometimes we will use a shot for this. But like I said, we prefer using the oral antibiotics and some of these other common ones and we'll rotate through them as needed. Uh, we used amoxicillin last month and the ear infection is still there. We're going to use something else. We'll use Augment or we'll use Cephamir or something like that. So uh, which one you get depends on what's been happening for the last uh, few weeks, few months. A lot of people ask us, how can I prevent this cold from turning into an ear infection? Well, there's not really a great way to do that. But there are some things you can do to help keep you from getting colds in the first place and help keep yeah, kind of help keep them from turning into ear infections or something worse like pneumonia or, or sinus infection. Breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is free and you transfer antibodies to your baby that way. Helps keep them from getting uh, infections in the nose and the throat. Helps keep them probably from getting ear infections. I'm sure that's going to be a good thing you can do. And uh, there's a lot of benefits to that. So breastfeeding is probably the most important thing. Avoiding tobacco exposure. If someone uh, smokes in the family, that smoke exposure, it's not some ethereal thing uh, that you just kind of smell. That's tiny little pieces of burnt tobacco and tiny little pieces of burnt paper and burnt chemicals floating off your clothes, off your skin, off your hair. The baby smells that, irritates the lining of the nose, causes more, more inflammation in the airway, especially when they get a cold. So stopping smoking would be the best. Smoking outside wearing a smoking jacket, taking it off, washing your hands, washing your face before you come near a baby or a child is a good idea. Do not smoke in the car with the windows down, it doesn't help. Do not smoke in the house, please. Um, hand hygiene, obviously. Uh, being in a smaller daycare where there's some good hand hygiene practices, making sure when, uh, especially when the older child comes home from school, have them wash their face and hands, maybe change their shirt so that younger kids in the family don't get colds which can lead to ear infections. Um, if your child has allergies, making sure that those are adequately treated. Uh, watch our video on allergies. We talk about all the over-the-counter allergy medications that may help with this. And finally, getting your vaccines. You all know me, I'm a proponent of vaccines. Pneumococcal vaccine has made a big impact on decreasing the number of recurrent ear infections that people get. Getting an RSV vaccine, getting a flu vaccine so that you have fewer colds during the flu season and uh, RSV season is also a great idea. So those are just some of the ways that you can prevent ear infections. Once you have a cold, whether or not it turns into an infection, well, that's what we're looking for. Fever, we're looking for ear pain, that kind of thing. But preventing it at that point is probably going to be pretty difficult. So try these other sources, washing your hands, staying away from tobacco smoke, and hopefully that will help. The last subject I want to talk about is surgery. Sometimes you have recurrent ear infections or uh, hearing loss from ear infections or uh, fluid behind the eardrum that even when there's not an active infection, the fluid is just not going away. In that case, we may have you go see an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, ENT. And there are a couple surgeries that the uh, ENT surgeon can do. And I'm going to bring out my model again. Remember we talked about this is a eustachian tube and here's the middle ear. 
where the pus collects. And here's the eardrum, which is not really purple. So there's two surgeries that will help with recurrent ear infections. One is called a PE tube surgery or pressure equalization tube surgery. I'll get it one day. And that's a little tube that goes through the eardrum and creates a channel from the middle ear to the outer ear. And that way, if fluid builds up behind the eardrum, it can just drain out and come out before the child has ear pain and uh, fever and everything else. The other surgery that can be done if you have really bad uh, ear infections, usually we see this with people who have bad allergies or they have bad snoring, and that's removing the adenoids. Remember in that first picture we saw? Maybe I'll bring that up again. We saw that the adenoids are tissue that is right here around where this tube ends up in the back of the throat. Sometimes that tissue can get sick or swollen, and it can kind of cause problems with this ear, uh, with this uh, eustachian tube draining properly. And when that happens, you can take out those, those adenoids, and it may make a lot more room so that this drains better when the child gets a cold. Sometimes you'll see kids get that together, uh, or maybe even tonsillectomy. But what they'll do most of the time is uh, just the adenoids and put in PE tubes, and that should make things better. The ENTs decide on this based on a lot of things. How many ear infections have you had? How many have you had in a year? Have you had an effusion or fluid behind the eardrum that's been there for a long time? Do you have hearing loss? How old is a child? What time of year is it? I don't know if they plug this into a formula and come up with an answer. Some of it may be subjective, but I think they, they have their own rule book for doing this. And uh, the best thing to do is see what they think if you've had recurrent ear infections. See if, see if you might qualify for getting some ear tubes. Uh, one last thing about that. Ear tubes, if you do end up getting some, they're designed to last in the ear for about nine months, and then they should fall out on their own. If they're in there for more than a, like two years, the ENTs sometimes have to go in and pluck them out. But that's not that common. And after they're plucked out, the hole should close up and there shouldn't be any other problems. So now you know just about everything you need to know about middle ear infections. Next time, we're going to talk about earwax. So fun. Y'all know me. I'm Dr. B, and this has been The Buzz on Parenting and Pediatrics. We'll see you next time.